Why the new iPhones won't get 5G, Apple Music is coming to your Echo devices, and learn whether you should or should not lick a Tesla coil. All that and more coming up on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode number 639, recorded Tuesday, December 4th, 2018. Multi-channel wiener filter. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Privacy.com. Stop using the same card number everywhere. Use Privacy Virtual Cards and get a $5 credit off your first purchase. Learn more and sign up in under a minute with your debit or checking account at Privacy.com slash MacBreak. And by Toto Washlet. Upgrade a once mundane trip to the bathroom into a spa-like experience with Washlet. To learn more and for special savings, go to wayfair.com slash MacBreak and enter promo code MacBreak at checkout. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash MacBreak. Welcome to MacBreak Weekly. This is the show every week we talk about Apple stuff. Leo Laporte, you may know him because he usually sits in this chair and hosts this show, but he is out. I am Megan Maroney and I am joined by the regular gang. Uh, let's th- start with thought leader Andy Anatko from WGBH uh, in Chicago. Uh, Welcome, thought leader. I hope you are going to lead us with your thoughts. <laughs> this year, caftans only worn as scarves. <laughs> and also Renee Ritchie, uh, YouTuber extraordinaire, and uh, of ah. course from iMore. Uh, welcome to your show, Renee. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Again, it's, it's great to. I'm sure Leo is off doing a tasting menu in some country, <laughs> in some city, in some fabulous restaurant somewhere. But we're holding down the fort. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm worried. I'm worried that he's jeopardizing his restaurant reservation because he heard tell of a Pokemon somewhere nearby. That's, re- that's only available for the holidays. Probably. Uh, and let 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 we not list we not forget. Let's we're we're not going to forget <laughs> you, Alex Lindsay. Oh, uh, I use thought leader and YouTuber, um, uh, influencer of all the rest of the stuff. Alex Lindsay from Pixel Core. Hey, how's it going? It's go- salt influencer. That's what I'll call you. <laughs> you're, you're always- it's all about 2019 is all about bamboo. <laughs> That's all I have to say. So I've never hosted this show before. And I asked Carson before, like, what order do I go in? Do I go in the order you tell me to? And he said I could do whatever I wanted. So um, let's. Power. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's, yes, uh, whatever I want. So let's uh, let's start with um, the feed, the five G story that that came out yesterday. Uh, Apple plans to wait until 2020 before releasing an iPhone that works with five G. Um, this was uh, according to Bloomberg, uh, Mark Gurman's and friends uh, on Bloomberg. Is this a big deal? I mean, this is what happens all the time, right? When we go to three G and four G, um, Apple waits a while, right? Yeah, yeah they're particularly- super conservative. Oh, am I supposed to it's, call on you guys? Oh. Is that what? Or you raise your hand? No, I defer to no, Andy. No, Renee, it's just, you we're start. All, we're Renee. All <laughs> I was going to say, Apple has historically been super conservative when it comes to radio technology. Like you mentioned, there was no 3G in the first iPhone. They didn't go to LTE the same time HTC did. And as someone who used the HTC Thunderbolt that lasted all of two hours on full charge and maybe melted its way through a table or two, it's usually because the initial chipsets are big and hot and power consuming and just aren't as good as the second and third generation chips. So Apple typically waits. And also by the time the second and third generation chips come out, the technology is actually deployed uh, where a, a greater percentage, not even a large, but a greater percentage of people can use it. One of the things that I think is really important is understanding how complicated 5G is going to be. Yeah. So uh, a lot of us are talking about it, and 5G is going to come out very slowly for most of the country. Um, it is a – the, the density of the trans – ponders that are required and you know it's two every 250 feet and so there are lots of little they're little transponders but there's lots of them and it is going to be very difficult to get those out past the center of a lot of cities 
And so it, it's going to take, it's probably the most expensive rollout. It's probably, it's also why we're seeing such a push to get rid of uh, net neutrality is because of how much money is about to be spent on getting 5G rolled out. Now, once it's out, there's a lot of opportunities, but it's not going to happen by 2020. And so there's where we're going to see 5G and where we're going to feel left out if, if, if anywhere is going to be at large event spaces where um, they start to really push that. So a Moscone, uh, an arena, you know, those types of things are probably going to see, um, you know, that because it's, there's a lot of um, point of sale opportunities that are going to be new for 5G. And so we're going to see those there. We're going to see them in uh, dense populated areas. But as soon as you get out, I mean, literally not even get out of San Francisco, as soon as you get near the bridge, you're probably going to go back down to 4G uh, for the foreseeable future. And so I think Apple is probably, it's, probably a great investment on theirs or a great non-investment on theirs to wait probably until 2020 or tw even 2021. What does yeah, that, feeling that, left out look like? Like, what does that look like if we're, you know, is it, are, do we really need that much faster? Yeah, that's, it's yeah, that, that's really fast. <laughs> It's like, you know, it's faster than your, faster than your cable network. You know, like it's, 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 it, they're talking, I mean, the, the, the raw speed of the network is in the terms of gigs. Um, you know, they're, they're definitely gonna be able to serve you, uh, high, you know, high hundreds of megabits per second. Uh, latency is a big deal because it's going to be much lower. Uh, the latencies can be in the sub 10 range, although it probably in working in reality probably won't be that quite that low. Uh, but it's, it, it's a completely different, it's, it's, it's as fast or faster than your home network. I mean, what we're really looking at is for 5G is eventually getting to a point where you don't have cable at home in a Wi-Fi network. And it's probably why Apple, uh, my guess is why Apple might have let go of uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> so, because I think that, uh, you know, 5G will slowly take over that, that whole era where you're not really, and that's why the advantage for T-Mobile and the advantage for a lot of other folks is being able to move into that market, uh, the, the traditional cable, cable TV market. But of course, what they need to do is you know, there's a lot of wrangling that they have to do. Number one is getting that density. Number two is is probably negotiating zero rating for most of the uh, media organizations, which is, again, why they probably want to get rid of uh, net neutrality. M more than anything else, they just want to zero rate a lot of things. Um, and uh, and so there's uh, there's all of that's going to be a wrestling match that's going to happen over the next two or three years. And so I, I, Apple, to the point that Renee made, the, all the chips will be expensive. They'll be power hungry. Um, they, they won't integrate well. Second, third generation is going to be a lot better. The market, the the infrastructure that they're setting into is going to be better. We will hear people complain about it by 2021 of, you know, I, I went to, there was all these cool things I could do at the stadium with my Samsung and I couldn't do it with my, my iPhone. Um, but we're pretty far out. It's going to take a long time and a lot of money to uh, get the 5G um, market, you know, set up. Andy? <laughs> Uh, right now, the problem is that 5G is a solution for one of a problem. Uh, one of the reasons why LTE really took the uh, really uh, took everyone by storm is that it solves so many problems. There are people with phones who are like, God, I really, I can't. Why can't I watch Netflix on the bus? Or why can't I? Uh, why can't uh, Why can't I uh, upload this like 1080p video? Uh, to uh, my friends and to my feed, uh, and have to why, why do I have to like wait like an hour for this thing to to upload? Whereas with 5G, LTE is fine for everything that people do with mo with mobile right now. So what it's going to take is for someone to come up with the killer app or the killer product, whether it's uh, wearables that are constantly communicating what you're seeing to someone else and constantly having to receive what other people are seeing, uh, or whether it's just simply the idea of uh, uh, cable companies wanting to stop having to lay new cable and wanting to simply build towers instead. Uh, it's it's going to take a long time for anybody to adopt. Uh, even uh, the the uh, Motorola, I think, <laughs> was bragging about how uh, this uh, the, the this this new phone that they're selling is going to be the first one that will be five G compatible because it's that one it's that model that they have where it has pogo pins in the back so you can slap on like a camera slap on a battery so they're promising that sometime in the future they're going to build like a five G thing you can slap onto that um, Samsung too has said one five G phone next year and you know that they're pretty much planning that they're only going to be selling it to people who are in the business who need to test out 5G networks. So yeah, this is, it could take a few years for uh, it's this to become important. And even when it becomes important, it might not be important for a phone to have it. 
So uh, let's move on to what I think is one of the biggest stories of last week. Uh, Apple Music is coming to Echo Devices. This is very exciting and and super interesting because everyone's saying like, oh, Amazon and and Apple are now friends. But it really makes you think (laughs) if people, I mean, if Apple really just at some point just realized they're selling more Apple Music subscriptions than they are HomePods. Uh, I looked at the numbers a little bit. There's uh, at last check, there's around 50 million Apple Music subscribers and also 50 million Echo devices. So it's like around the same <laughs> number. Uh, Andy, what, what do you think about uh, Apple Music coming to the Echo? That's a really, really big deal. Uh, one of my usual complaints is about Apple is that it really, it, it's not impress- impressive to me that you've cre- Apple's created an Apple service that runs on Apple hardware that's running Apple operating systems. Uh, the big deal is when you try to make something that appeals to everybody, even the people who paid $29 on Black Friday to get this cute little Echo Dot. Uh, so for everyone who's, who's subscribing to uh, Apple Music, it makes the product that much more valuable that now that they can use it on the stuff that they've already got and not have to spend $350 just to listen to their playlists in the kitchen while they're cooking. So yeah, that's, it's a huge, huge step for the uh, for the usability of Apple Music. And I hope, <laughs> I, I hope that Apple starts to fail in more hardware segments so that they start to open up like iMessage and they start to open up <laughs> other things uh, to, to, to other users because they have great stuff. And I just wish that people who don't necessarily, who have either not chosen or can't afford Apple hardware could get access to this, these wonderful software and services. Renee, what do you think? I mean, Apple Music has historically been different from Apple. When they first launched it, they they bought it from Beats and it ran on iOS and Android. And surprise of some, Apple didn't cancel the Android part of it. They actually deployed a whole new Apple Music version for Android. And I think the thinking at the time was there are going to be people who get a family plan for this and they are going to be cross-device, multi-device households. They'll have some iOS people, some Android people, and it creates better value for them if they can play it on any of the devices, regardless of what the kids have, what the parents has, all of that. And I think this is very much that, but taken to the, the new level of popularity that home assistants have. And if you get an Apple Music plan, and you have a HomePod or you don't, you have iPhones, but you also have Echoes, this just makes that plan way more valuable to you. And I think it behooves Apple um, and their position in the market to make Apple Music, especially family plans, not just as convenient, but as good an experience as possible for people. So do we all subscribe to Apple Music? I do, yes. And Spotify? Yes. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Alex just recently convinced me uh, to to subscribe to Spotify because he just I just did the numbers and I thought like I'm not able to listen to the music that I want to listen to on all of my Echo devices and you know really another ten dollars a month is it that big of a deal? But now I feel like uh, why would I have it at all? Because I now I know how to transfer my playlist back and forth. I mean, is there any reason to keep? Are you guys going to keep Spotify? The two of you that still have it. I. I, I still haven't figured out. I, I have a lot of playlists on Spotify, and I'm, I have not, I have yet to get one playlist that has more than a hundred songs get from one, get from Spotify <laughs> to Apple Music uh, successfully. You know, with with all the different import tools, I'm like, how hard could this be? It's a it's a band. It's not even like that rare. It's a band and a song, but evidently that's a very complicated thing for these guys to do. And so, uh, so I haven't completely changed over. Um, there's something about the Spotify playlist building process that I find and I can't quite put my finger on it that I just find um, uh, more seamless and I can't I can't exactly figure out so I, I, I have a tendency not to um, think that I'm gonna do it I, mostly for app for me Apple music is so that I can just say hey play this you know that's that's the service that I that I needed to do and it seems to do that pretty well but I don't build any lists there. I feel like Spotify thinks I'm cooler than I really am. Like the music that (laughs) it it recommends to me is like, oh, that sounds good. Whereas, I don't know, maybe just Apple Music and iTunes is so like my recommendations are so old. It'll still be like a lot of uh, music that I made my kids listen to or that my kids made me listen to. So that is, um, you know, just suddenly (laughs) um, Megan Trainor pops up a lot. And I just feel like (laughs) that's not me. I mean, it might be me, but it's not the me that I want to project to the world. Spotify knows. Well, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think that's interesting because I don't listen to anything that it recommends. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't ever try. I mean, I just, I guess, I have all these playlists, and if I hear a song, I usually my, and I think this is why Apple was good. It was a good buy to buy Shazam. If, if I hear a song that I like at Starbucks or at, you know, some somewhere else, or or I'm, you know, someone's playing it on the on a car, I'll I'll, I'll Shazam it, and then, but then I put it into my Spotify list. <laughs> so, but I don't, I don't really expect Spotify to. I'm not like I, I never was one of those people that liked Pandora. You know, I don't really need a 
I guess I'm too picky. I'm too like, oh, I don't like that. And so, uh, so, uh, it's never really worked for me to go, to go down that path. Well, you brought up, um, Andy, you brought up like maybe bringing iMessage to Android like that. I mean, I know you were kind of joking, but that, that's not the next step, right? Because no. that would mean that they, you know, I mean, iMessage sells iPhones, right? Don't you think? They're never going to open that up for, for a whole bunch of reasons. They're not going to open it up. I don't think that. I think it, that's a, it keeps people that was, it was a fun iPhones. thing to talk about, but mm -hmm. sorry. No, I said it keeps people on iPhones, but it's always very careful. Like BBM, BlackBerry Messenger, kept people on Blackberries for a long time. It was either like a sign that you worked on Wall Street or wanted to, or wanted to be near people who did. But then WhatsApp just cloned everything about BBM, went cross-platform, and took all the value out of it, and ended up being worth ten times more than BlackBerry as a company. So there's a fine line between proprietary services and when you need to take them open. And I don't think Apple is anywhere near that line yet, but it'll be something interesting to watch in the in the years ahead yeah, as I, Apple's services that, business becomes more important. I think that it's more for them. They just don't want to support something else. Like they don't want to have to deal with it. Um, it's, well, there's it's no simpler. business, right? There's no way to monetize it because they're not going to sell ads against it and sticker packs aren't going to do it. And it's uh, adding a billion right. users. There's a lot of server activity. Well, yeah. Well, and, and, yeah, go ahead. What, what about a subscription service? I mean, somebody joked on Twitter that- they Nobody would, will pay for it though. Yeah, I mean, I joke because I would pay $20 for the one woman in my book group that- um, that still has a pixel or that has a pixel <laughs> because it's just, and I, I feel like I have one in every group of uh, big group chats that I have and it just ruins everything. You can't rename the group and you can't, you know, every, every message that comes in is like, so-and-so liked Re this, so-and-so loved now, this. Maybe iMessage for the web though, like instead of Android and Windows and whatever support, I, just having iMessage for iCloud could be a way to sort of do enough, just enough like they do with I, I work to get people over that hump. Yeah. Well, because it's such- well, I find- Go ahead. I just said, I, I find that if I if I have someone uh, that I, um, other than probably Andy, uh, but if, <laughs> almost anybody that's a green message on, on mine, I find some other platform to talk to them. Like, I just don't, like, I don't, uh, like, if if they if I see a green message, they're going to start getting messages from me on Messenger or on LinkedIn yes. or, or something else. Because, you know, like, I, I, I'm like, uh, I'm not going to do that. Like, I just, the cross phone thing, as soon as I see green message, I mean, I, I, I go back and forth with Andy, but that's, I think Andy's the only one that I talk to with a green message. Yeah, I think uh, Jason Howell and Florence Zion are my green message people. And you're right, I found other ways to communicate with them, but they're technical people like the, you know, women that are my close friends are not always as technical, which means right. most of them are on iPhones, but then there's the occasional person that's been convinced into a pixel. And, um, you know, I guess my only choice is to not be friends with them anymore. Yeah. My like mom. Alex, that defaults to Facebook messenger for me very quickly. And all my friends, all my family use iMessage, but there are people in my community that I have to organize things with. And then it just defaults to messenger because everybody has it. Yeah. Mm hmm. We're going to talk more Apple stuff. Renee, uh, delve deep into the mystery of where the air power uh, is, why we haven't seen it. I want to find out about that. And uh, Apple announced its best of 2018. Uh, we are not on it, but um, that is okay. <laughs> uh, I'm all for the frog dissection app that is on it, and we'll talk about that too. But first, I want to thank our sponsor for this show, privacy.com. If you listen to this show or really any shows that Leo hosts, you probably have tons of subscriptions. You've signed up for everything. And then you go and look at your credit card bill and think, oh, oh I'm still paying for that. You don't want to do that anymore. And I have a way that you can stop do doing that. You can control your finances with privacy.com. It's simple. It's a simple download. It's an easy browser extension uh, from the Chrome Web Store. Um, you can also get it on your Android device or your. there's an, also an iOS app, of course. Get it on your iPad or your iPhone. And then you link to virtual cards. You link them to your U.S. checking account or your debit card. Uh, you don't use the same password everywhere, so why use the same credit card number when you shop online? Privacy.com generates a brand new virtual Visa card number for every single purchase that you make online, and it's just one click. It doesn't take a lot of time. Virtual cards are locked to a merchant, so you don't have to worry about changing your card everywhere. If one, if one of your cards get hacked, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, you Each merchant has its own number. You can freeze and unfreeze cards. You can set spending limits per charge per month or per year. Never worry about being billed twice or upgraded without your consent. And there's no need to worry about forgetting to cancel subscriptions or free trials. Again, refunds work even if the card is closed or paused and you can earn up to 5% cash back. The security of your data is at the core of what privacy.com does. They're PCI DSS compliant. 
and are held to the same security standards as your bank. You can, uh, information is encrypted using split key encryption with partial keys held by separate employees. Sensitive information is secured using military grade encryption. No single person can access the sensitive data on the server because it requires multiple keys to decrypt. And true to their name, these cards let you use any billing information you like. So you can use anything. That That's what privacy.com means. It's your privacy. It's yours. You get to choose what you reveal and when your information remains secure and private. Privacy.com believes customers should have full control of their data. So they provide their customers access to transaction data via a webhook API. And of course, they support two-factor authentication. Privacy.com right now is only available in the U.S., but it is 100% free to use, just like credit cards. They make money from the merchants, so they won't sell your information. And there are no hidden fees. Privacy.com has saved customers over $100 million in unwanted and unauthorized charges due to compromised cards, hidden fees, and forgotten subscriptions. Protect your privacy and your money with virtual cards from Privacy.com. To learn more and get a $5 credit off your first purchase, visit Privacy.com slash MacBreak. Make sure to add MacBreak. So it's privacy.com slash MacBreak. That way they know that we sent you there. Privacy.com slash MacBreak. And we thank privacy.com for their support of MacBreak Weekly. All righty. Uh, let's see. Oh, we were talking about getting uh, about the HomePod and how, you know, it's much more expensive than the Echo devices. Uh, and I guess it's more expensive for a reason, and uh, Apple wanted to prove that, so they um, just released this really long, uh, there's a lot of math <laughs> in it, a long <laughs> white paper about what's inside uh, the HomePod. Alex, what did you think of uh, of that? I thought it was stunning. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, I, re I read it uh, a couple times, and we, we we spend a little time talking about it. Someone that works with uh, with me um, has spent a lot of time doing. Uh, very high quality DSP work. So, um, and so the two of us talked about it a little bit and it is, it is really fascinating, uh, what, what they're doing there. It's not so much that it's, you know, all of it is there. Uh, it's just understanding how complicated it is when Siri doesn't react to you to understand like what Siri has to do to make that actually work, I think is fascinating. So there's, you know, you basically have this, um, you have multi-channel echo cancellation, which is the MCEC. Uh, and then you also have the residual echo suppressor, which is the RES, the <laughs> SPP, which is the speech presence probability, the MCWF, which is the multi-channel wiener filter <laughs> which is it which is actually a thing <laughs> and the uh, and the dnn uh which is the D deep neural network and so basically the what they're what they're doing is is that that what uh all of those things that those are all in the paper here um it's not you know anthony, we anthony wiener does not have any part of this okay. but it's a wiener filter it's 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 a uh um but the basically it has to make a decision so there's a bunch of things that that the speaker has to do and and a lot of what they were talking about is being able to handle your you know be what what it's looking for is ask you know hey you know so the haste command now the haste command by itself is complicated because you're in a different place in the building uh, you you can be all over the room you might have an accent you might you know have uh, ambient noise so it has to go through and, and get rid of all of those things so there's some basic noise filtering uh, that's sampling you know what's out there it's it's distinguishing you but not only does it have to distinguish you but it has to distinguish you from many other voices so it's probably making you know what it, what they're talking about is making decisions about you know which channel to look at you know as far as it's it's picking up all these different voices and it has to model that now the the, the reason that, that that command is so important is because that is actually much easier when you're talking to we're going to have this for a, quite a few years until we have more powerful chips it's important that it is a specific thing that you have to say to it because then that that marker that it's looking for is is smaller but around that when you say hey or, or hey whatever i shouldn't say that on the on the air but none of my devices went say, off which is con confusing yeah. that they didn't <laughs> <laughs> um uh but the uh when you say that command uh, it then has to start separating you out from everything else is th that, that's there. So there's an array of six uh, mics. Those are there. It's it's it, and it has to deal with the reflections of all the audio in the room. It has to model what that what that looks like. It's talking about moving nulls around to decide. Okay, I'm going to ignore these areas. These are the the the, the areas of the of uh, that are most problematic. And so there's an enormous amount of work. I mean, it it, it was just a, a fascinating. It's not that none of it makes sense. It's just that when you look at it 
it is an, it's, it's amazing at the enormous amount of processing that's going on just so that it can respond to you. And, and all of these speakers are doing something like it. Um, but what they're, you know, a, a lot of what they're doing is, you know, doing heavy, you know, a lot of training using the, uh, you know, some of it's offsite where they're, they're, they're training these, uh, you know, training the model and some of it's constantly reacting and dynamically responding to your, uh, to your room. So it's, you know, and then the, the hardest part is when you, they're talking about when the music is playing, your voice may be 30 or 40 decibels lower than the, and 30, 40 decibels. I mean, just to be clear, 30, 40, 40 decibels, you can barely hear it. So 40 decibels is a long way back behind the music. Um, for them to be able to pull something out of that uh, is is kind of uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, we've we've had we have to deal with a lot of noise suppression uh, in what what I do, and and so um, watching you know looking at that breakdown was was fascinating. You could probably spend a week just studying that paper and all the papers that it's that it that it references, and you'd learn a lot about you know audio processing. It, it's a if if you haven't read it, uh, I had to read it. And then I put it into speak mode, <laughs> like speech mode, and I listened to it and read it again. It took me a little while to kind of dig through all the little all the things that they're doing, and I think I still need to read it a couple of times. But definitely worth the read. Um, it's 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 a really great little window into how much work it is to have these things be relatively effortless. What did you think, Renee? Yeah, I thought exactly what Alex said in terms of the raw technology that they were bringing to bear. And when Apple first announced that at WWDC and Craig Federici said he could whisper across the room and and it could hear him, you know, there were a lot of guffaws because Siri does have a bad reputation uh, when it comes to just detecting voice in general. But this was Apple's first real far field device that's plugged into outlets that had a beam forming arrays of microphones that was doing everything that living room devices like the Echo had been doing for a while. So they had to figure out far field Siri. We've got AirPods, which are near field Siri and phones, which are kind of near to mid range. But this was a device that could be across the room, around the corner, up the stairs, all of those things. But I think what's even more fascinating is that Apple published this. Apple. Uh, is not a company that usually opens a kimono and shows off how it does things. But they've had this tension with machine learning and artificial intelligence experts who really want to be and want to have their work in the public eye, not just because they want to build up their credibility, though I'm sure they do, but because they want to share the information. They're part of academic communities and they're part of larger efforts to sort of work out the big challenges in artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, natural language processing, all of these monumental tasks. And it just it's it's great that Apple has the, I don't want to call it confidence because it's not that, but has the willingness to sort of let all this information out. And I hope they really continue. The machine learning blog has just been, sorry, the machine learning journal has just been fascinating to read. I, I mean, I do really appreciate that about the HomePod, especially now that I've used it more and more for home automation. As you know, I've, I've got my all my house set up now on uh, smart plugs, uh, especially for the with all the holiday lights. And it's so nice to be able to just be anywhere and talk to talk to the HomePod. I mean, the HomePod is usually who listens. Um, I recorded a video of myself because I was so excited about being able to turn my lights <laughs> off and on with my voice. I know, I'm sure most people have already been able to do that, but I was very excited about it. Um, but then I don't know, you know, people complained because they were, I was turning their tree on and off uh, when they were playing the video because I, I included the, you know, hey, Siri. Well, you can, I mean, if if you set up a shortcut that was just yo Siri, ho, 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 and all your lights came on, Megan, for like the Christmas tree, that would be amazing. I am, I I can there. do that. I have the power. I could do that right now. Yes. <laughs> Shortcut to a diehard Christmas. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. So that I thought that was really interesting. I thought it was interesting that um, that all of that came right on the heels of uh, of opening Apple Music to um, uh, to Amazon Echoes because it it felt like Apple was also saying like yes we understand that our HomePod is really expensive and this well is it's why. also super interesting because it came right on the heels of Amazon starting to sell all of Apple's stuff yes. which I think goes to the deepening of the relationship between those two companies and the mutually beneficial deepening of that relationship but are they selling HomePods so. isn't that the one thing they're not selling no they're not selling HomePods but they are selling iPhones iPads and they're getting almost like first name what do they call it Alex first first uh, citizens treatment. Yeah, Best in class yeah. treatment. I, I, I think the only thing we're missing now is being able to order books on Audible. Okay. <laughs> so we still but on the Apple TV, it looks list. like, I forget, someone tweeted yesterday that you can add HBO on the Apple TV 
Uh, maybe it was right. Ben Thompson. Like they, they are deepening the hooks that they'll have between the two companies. So maybe these are just first steps. I can, I have the HBO Go. Oh, no, no. So I have the HBO Go, not HBO Now. But you can do HBO Now on, on the Apple TV, right? But there was a, pri- there was a, there was a Prime functionality, because you can, I think, also get it through Prime. And there was a little box saying, do you subscribe to Prime or do you want to subscribe to HBO oh, through Prime, right. which is not normal on an Apple TV. Moving on, 9 to 5 Mac has a story about an all-new design for the AirPods, but that's not until 2020. But apparently we might get wireless charging first uh, in 2019, and the and the case will be upgraded, so that, that's how we'll get the wireless charging. Um, Andy, what do you think about a new uh, set of AirPods? Do you need them? Uh, well, the old uh, the thing the thing with earphones of any kind is that as long as they work, so not, as long as they sound good for the person who's using them, and I'm not the person I'm not the person who's buying like eight hundred dollar headphones. I'm the person who's using like eighty dollar headphones, and the ear cup is starting to come apart. And I should probably spend ten dollars on a new pair of ear cups, but I haven't gotten around to it yet because it doesn't affect the sound and in one bit. Uh, and so long as the connectivity works, as long as the Bluetooth is still good. It's not a huge priority. Everyone's really waiting for uh, for wireless charging. So I think that most people who are looking to upgrade their AirPods or AirPods are waiting for that. As for up, uh, other updates, I don't know. I think I think that the the only thing that the, the only disadvantage that the current AirPods have for some people is that you still have that sort of like candlestick sticking out of your ear. Whereas in the past couple of years, all the other truly wireless earbuds that have come along are actually kind of like earbuds. So it'd be nice to see something that's more uh, more discreet. It would also be nice to have something with like more tap sensors on it so that you can interact a lot more with your device with it. Volume up, volume down, track skip, uh, Siri, instead of having to just choose one thing to put to adjust the tap to. It'd be nice if uh, I could simply uh, it could be sort of like an Apple Watch for the ears. Uh, so I'd be really excited to update if they did that. Uh, but I think most people, yeah, the huge priority is going to be get wireless charging, if only to save face <laughs> to actually ship the darn thing. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. I think if you already own AirPods, I don't see any reason to buy new ones unless the unless the connectivity works much better. If there's a better range, um, I noticed that the one thing I have learned is that. My AirPods do not handle polygamous relationships very well. So they, uh, Neither you know, do I, if, if you start, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most people, most people don't. Yeah. So, so the, the, you know, the, the, uh, what I mean by that, of course, is that if you start connecting them to lots of things, I got, we're really not judging, and, 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 we're iPad. not, we're not judging if the relationship <laughs> works for you. So, as long as there's communication <laughs> and honesty, big Bluetooth love, <laughs> big Bluetooth love. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm so sorry, I, 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 I felt, I felt like some, some of our listeners might have felt like they've been targeted or judged. I want to dispel okay. that. Oh, yes. I <laughs> said continue. personally, me. This is my experience. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah it's Exactly. Yeah. So no, I, I, I started connecting them to a lot of uh, different devices, different iPads and my, my computer and my and, and now they're just confused. I had to reset them, you know, like really reset the whole thing and say, OK, no, you only have to pay attention to this phone. Uh, so so I think that <laughs> maybe being able to manage that a little bit more effectively would be great. Uh, the I, I do think that uh, they do flip out every once in a while. It seems like in the new operating in the new the newest updates to the phone, they don't seem quite as stable as they were, which they were rock stable before. Uh, so I think they're they're probably working through something there, uh, but I think that overall, if you have the AirPods, unless they make some radical change, I I, I don't think they're going to get rid of the the carrot stick or the little stick coming out of your ear because I think uh, it is dramatically improves the quality of your voice uh, when you're talking on the phone. I mean, most of the ones that are that are pods that just go into your ear, uh, if you're really committed to just listening, they work great. If you actually want to use them for the phone, uh, they don't. They don't work nearly as well. So, so I think that those that you know that's probably the, the why they're going to remain that way. I don't I don't expect any kind of major form change. I think uh, if you didn't have them before, this will be another re- good reason to get them. If you have them, you'll probably wait for something radical. For me, there's a couple of things that are super interesting. Like the you'll probably be able to get just the charging case. So if all you want is the wireless charging, you'll probably be able to get those for your first gen AirPods and keep going. Uh, it does depend on your battery life because they will they will degrade in battery life over time. And after two years or so, maybe maybe you want to refresh if you travel a lot. But I think otherwise, for a lot of people, the sweat proofing will be beneficial, especially people who want to wear them to work out. I know not everybody, and it's not a large scale problem, but some people do sweat a lot, and over time, continued <laughs> exposure either to rain when you're running outside or to 
sweat when you're working out inside does have a deleterious effect on the electronics. So that that will be great for some people. Onboard Siri, depending on the status of your internet connection or whether devices you have with you. And eventually, you know, as as you start looking towards 2020 and beyond, if you start having onboard Apple Music, for example, where it can just attach to any wireless network you've already attached to the way an Apple Watch could two generations ago before it got LTE. And you don't even have to have your watch with you anymore when you work out. Those will probably be the features that people like. I agree with Andy that the stock still looks funny, but I've tried the other ones too, and they really aren't good for capturing, not just for phone calls, but if you want to use your AirPods when you're recording video, if you're if you're running gunning it or things like that. I know that's a niche need, but for oh, some people it's it's yeah, for some people it's still important. For me though, I, it, I have one ear that's great for ear pods and the other ear is so mangled from jujitsu that it just, <laughs> it isn't great. So if they could figure out um, a way to cater to a slightly wider scenario of ears, I would love them a long time as well. So you're wearing one AirPod right now, Renee. I almost always do. I can wear two. I, I'm not usually listening to music. I'm usually listening to podcasts mm -hmm. uh, or I'm doing video recording and stuff and I only need one AirPod. And this year is fine, but the other ear has been mangled even worse. So it doesn't, it just doesn't stay in as well. Do you have the other AirPod? Because one of my AirPods is broken, but yeah. it's that one. So if you could send me another one, then. <laughs> I would, but <laughs> MacBreak usually lasts just long enough for me to have to switch the, <laughs> okay. you know, for the. the okay, good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think mine are still covered by Apple Care. Uh, this is the second pair that I've had because the first ones just stopped working and then uh, I sent them back and they sent me another one. I don't know. I might be out of Apple Care, but they don't. Um, I have weirdly shaped ears, both of them, and they just don't stay in unless I'm sitting very still. So they've never. They are way better. Like I cannot wear traditional air, uh, headphones at all. They will pop. Like they will literally pop out as if they're popcorn. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge improvement for me, but we're just not all the way yet. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal. That, that's why I do wear like the over the ear muffs because my my ear my ear hole endurance for uh, AirPods or any, or the even the regular wired ones is about forty five minutes to an hour, and usually we record for like at least ninety minutes, and that's one less thing for me to worry about. So it's such a particular thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so yeah, I, and Apple's supposedly my, working my, on the headphones too, so we'll have a choice eventually. My, I, I do find that my limit for the AirPods is mostly uh, when the battery dies. <laughs> I, put, I put them on and I just leave them on. I forget that they're there. I'm just kind of like doodling yeah. away. And, and, and then I hear that you know, how many times are you going to hear the little doodle -doo to, to yeah. warn you that you are well, I, about I'm, to I'm a sensitive. I'm a sensitive little milk toast. I, I have delicate ears. I, I, don't, I don't have working man's ears like you do. Well, these, I think these, my ears these ears so have never up. known a day of hard work in their entire life. <laughs> I just think I have, I have IFBs in my in my ear so often, and then I have in ear like everything that I've had for the last ten years has all been stuck in my ear in in different ways, shapes, or forms. So I think that it's I'm I'm uh, I have coarse ears. They don't they don't care anymore about any of those things. I do I, I am surprised at how quickly I got used to. I I thought that I would never give up my wired. Uh, headphones because you know they're they do block out the sound more i use these little atomotic uh, uh wire uh, wired head headsets but the only time i use them now is when my airpods battery has died mm -hmm. and uh which doesn't happen very often because i'm a little neurotic about about charging them but i i never thought i'd get to that point where i didn't want to use the wired ones so renee where yes is the air power is it like where's waldo like we're not looking hard enough if we looked harder we'd find it where, where is the air power I mean, it's it's in Cupertino, California. <laughs> I mean, where it's always been. It's just that it hasn't gotten to the point where Apple can ship it yet. And it's one of those things where Apple is usually a company that doesn't pre-announce things, but they're also a company that when they do make a radical change, they like to have some sort of technological accessory to go along with it to sort of seal the deal, to show off a little bit. Like AirPods were when they went when they got rid of the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. They were like, we're going to make wireless headphones better. And then they got rid of the metal back, and they're like, we're going to make wireless charging better but it turns out wireless charging is is okay on its own but when you want to start wirelessly charging a phone a watch that uses a different kind of wireless charging and more magnetism magnetic based as well as inductive and airpods things that have different capacity requirements as well that gets super complicated and they just from all all the stories we're hearing they just were not able to make that a functional product at least as originally designed and at least not yet and I mean, I guess they deserve some base level of credit for not shipping a terribly broken product because that would literally be even worse. But it's just they were they were hoping to get it out, I think, early 2018, then summer 2018, then <laughs> fall 2018. And if you read all the articles and all the stuff, they bought companies to try to fix some of the problem. They, they hired really smart people to try to fix it, people who are confident they could. And it just is not working up to the standards of a shipping product. 
And I think the lessons we take from this one is that just, you know, as much as you might want to pre-announce, you should only ever pre-announce when you're, you know, weeks away, not when you're months away. Uh, and two, you know, some, it, it is better not to ship than to ship really bad things. So uh, maybe, well, there is maybe 2019, pressure. but will they be the same product is the bigger question. And I think there's some pressure. I think the problem for Apple is, is the idea of, of saying, well, we couldn't do it. So we have released something different is a pretty difficult conversation for that company to have. As much as it is to say that we haven't gotten to it yet, uh, it's, it's, it's in also public, very complicated. Though, I mean, in private, they reboot over and over and over again. But this oh, yeah, one went yeah. public way too soon. I don't think that they're going to do this, like the idea of, of announcing something that far out. I mean, they did it with the HomePod. They did it, you know, they've, they've done it in the past uh, with the iMac Pro. Uh, you know, so there's there's been... A track record of doing that more recently than they did before, uh, but I, I think this is a this is a pretty good lesson. I think the hard part for them is once they get past CES, I think CES we're probably going to see a lot of different yeah. wireless charging solutions, and uh, it'll be an uphill battle. In the same way that they, it's an uphill battle for them to make penetration where where the Echo uh, and the and the Google Home are already implanted. Uh, they're going to have a hard time making this really worth it after uh, after January, February. So when they also, say that. Go ahead. Also, I think I, just quickly, I think that wireless charging is kind of special because it, it can never be perfect because all you can do is make it easier to line up the device with the right pad to make charging work. I mean, if it the per, the the platonic ideal of wireless charging is literally a bowl, and you just drop what you want into this beautiful like bowl that's on this beautiful Johnny Ive designed bowl that's on your nightstand, and it somehow. <laughs> It somehow finds like electricity inside the bowl, and so you got two phones, and you got a watch, and it, and it just plain works. But so long as it's always going to be, it's 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 a it's it's not a lateral improvement over plugging in something into the base, uh, but it's almost a lateral improvement to having like a phone stand where it's almost as easy as dropping it in to make that connection. So I I, I would be really, really pleased if Apple focused on features rather than simply wireless charging. Like, again, like I said, to make it sort of like an Apple watch for the ears, to make it so that you can interact with your phone or your watch for things that don't that shouldn't even require you to even raise your wrist to really get the computers inside there figuring out that actually I think I can predict and plan what this person uh, would want to say or how they would want to respond to this notification. So I'll just give them a yes or no question uh, that they could then figure out or just a tap that they could simply navigate through. So that's that would really set them apart from all of the really, really excellent $170 true wireless Bluetooth buds that are out there. There were also two two big areas where, uh, like, AirPods did change the game a little bit for wireless headphones because of the W1 chip and the instant pairing and a lot of the features that they provided. But AirPower wasn't really going to change much because they're the two big revolutions we need in wireless charging are ubiquity, so that every Starbucks and coffee shop and restaurant and Uber and Lyft and airplane that you go into, as soon as you put your things down, they just start charging, and that's that's something that just time and scale will solve, but also lack of contact. Like to Andy's point, a little the, a little device that you put on your table and then anything within six inches of it just charges is way better for people than having to line up things and put them on a mat and put them on an area. And those air power doesn't address either, either of those things. I will admit, admit the flaw in my, in my bowl plan because immediately <laughs> like the cat would sleep in there and then they either get superpowers or they <laughs> would have an electric cat. <laughs> well, and I think the problem is is that is that the pro the problem with all of these for me is that it costs a lot more money to put these in different places. And for me, what keeps my stuff charged is the fact that every place I sit down regularly, I have some way to charge stuff. And so I've got, uh, you know, some version of three or four or five uh, uh, outputs of USB that I'm kind of plugging stuff into. So anywhere I'm going to sit down, whether it's my car, or my office, my where I go to bed, by the TV. I just have places to set it down. I don't want to invest in a wireless charger for each one of those locations. And to be honest with you, I think it would be a pain in the neck because a lot of times I want to charge it while I'm using it. And so, so I don't, I, I, it, it at we least, talked about it a lot. I, I just don't, you know, I, even if they come out with it, I'd be hard pressed to even buy it. I just, I, I don't see how it would improve my life at all. I'll just, I'll, I'll just say that the, if you, do, because it's all, uh, all uh, based on the cheese standard, you can buy Qi chargers for 10, 15, $20. Right. So, so, so if there, so it's not the same thing as these like uh, hue light bulbs that now have replaced every light bulb in my house. You start off by putting, buying a charger, wireless charger for the one or two places where it makes the most sense. And then two years later, you look around and say, wow, I actually do have a wireless charger like everywhere I'm likely to sit down and drop my phone. It's excellent. <laughs>
So I have one last question about this. When they say it wasn't working, was it an issue of it not charging or was it like setting fires to our bedside table? No. <laughs> so there was like three different issues that have been talked about. One is that, yeah, it was overheating. They weren't able to get control of the thermals because basically it had to be a little computer. It ran a stripped down version of iOS so that it could communicate and handle and understand the different charging and provide the messages because they created a whole interface where it would show up on your iPhone when you put your watch down, when you put your your headphones down. It was super ambitious, and therein, you know, lies lies the problems. The other one is, I believe, someone said they're having communication problems. Although I find that harder to believe because they're in such close proximity, and Bluetooth is a, is a known thing. But the last one, I forget what it was, but it had something to do with the way the coils were put because it involved like 21 different coils in order to handle all the different possible positions and devices. Because you could have two iPhones or an iPhone and AirPod, AirPods and an Apple Watch, and just the level of complexity of complexity introduced too many problems. Well, I want to talk about uh, Apple's announcements of the best of 2018. But before we do that, I want to talk about the best toilet of 2018. <laughs> and that, of course, <laughs> is the Toto washlet. Uh, you don't even have to get a whole new toilet. You can just get the top. Uh, Leo talks about this all the time. So you've, if you have heard of uh, Leo's toilet, now you're going to hear me talk about Leo's <laughs> toilet. It's revolutionary. Uh, there are no cameras on it. Don't worry. Everyone's always like, I don't need a IoT toilet. I don't need someone taking pictures. There are no cameras on the Toto washlet. It has auto open and close lid and a seat. That's good. That's healthy uh, for germs. You don't want to touch stuff. Imagine walking into your bathroom and having the toilet seat lid open to greet you and then close when you're finished, completely hands-free. Avoid arguments about leaving the seat up when it automatically closes for you. Uh, you will look back. If you get the washlet, you will look back and wonder how you ever got by without it. Everyone needs that. It's an electric bidet toilet seat. It was designed to provide a higher level of cleanliness and comfort. Enjoy a comforting heated seat that feels like you just wrapped yourself in a towel straight out of the dryer, or you can turn this feature off entirely during the summer months. With a touch of a button, a wand extends from under the seat for a soothing warm water cleanse. The automatic deodorizer will circulate the surrounding air over a filter to neutralize odors. Certain models even feature cutting edge technology that will keep your toilet clean, including a pre-mist spray that will spritz your toilet before use. And afterwards, models with e-water plus electrolyzed water will spray your toilet bowl that do it for you. Many washlets also feature additional advancements like a nightlight, remote controls. Also, on-demand water heating means you never run out of warm water. And don't forget that you will be reducing toilet paper and helping the environment. It will be the newest and most popular small home appliance in the coming years. You will just wait and see. Everyone's going to say that we saw it at Leo's house and we needed to get one of our own. Every day, more and more people are experiencing the clean revolution. So it, here's what you do if, you, if you're excited about this, and I know you are. Go to Wayfair.com slash MacBreak. That's Wayfair.com slash MacBreak. And you get all the information, everything that you're wondering about. I know you have questions. So go to Wayfair.com slash MacBreak. Use the promo code MacBreak at checkout for special savings when you make your purchase. Just for MacBreak listeners, special savings. We know you will love this innovative toilet seat, and it will change the way you experience clean Again, don't forget to go to wayfair.com slash MacBreak. Enter the promo code MacBreak at checkout. You have several models to choose from. Toto makes it easy to find the perfect one just for you. And we thank Toto for their support of this episode of MacBreak Weekly. All right. The best of 2018, according to Apple, is here. So they every year they rate apps, they rate podcasts, movies, uh, they rate books um, and audiobooks. And I, it's interesting because the best book, according to them, is also the same best, also the best audiobook. So what do we do? Do we read it on iBooks or do we listen to it? I don't know. Uh, their best book, by the way, was American Marriage. Um, and it is a great, great book. I highly recommend. Uh, so let's see who wants to go first. Andy, what did you think of this year's list so far? Uh, pretty good. Um, I kind of wish there was more stuff that nobody had ever heard of mm. because like people have heard of Black Panther, got a fair amount of press, good for them. Uh, but there's always like little documentaries and little movies that 
uh, were part of some sort of of, of a package deal uh, that just got uh, just got added to uh, just got added to the movie store. Um, I, I just it would be such a great opportunity to make people get get people to see their first Ozu film uh, or to again something that is they're not going to ever hear about unless somebody decides to put it on a featured page. Uh, and also, uh, it's really, really great when you see uh, all these. Uh, it's 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 a much bigger deal for the uh, highlighted apps than for movies. Because again, if you if you're successful enough as a creator that you've got your movie for sale or for streaming anywhere, you are so much f- uh, further ahead uh, in getting your getting your vision out there than anybody else. Uh, but uh, the app developers, that's still probably one of the few, that, that's still one of the very, very few mass media sort of kind of publishing where it really can be all the work of one person or two people. So when you have one person who gets that surge of sales for December and suddenly they can uh, they can afford butter instead of margarine in, in February, January, February, that's a really, really big deal. So I'm glad they're doing this because this is people really do pay attention to this sort of stuff. Was there anything on the list that anyone, anything not on the list that people were upset about? I mean, besides this podcast, obviously. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I, I, think and iOS today. I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm amazed at how far Pixelmator Pro has come, mm-hmm. you know, it, from, you know, being like, oh, it's pretty good to now I, I generally open it before I open Photoshop. And that's saying a lot because I, I use Photoshop for the last uh 25 years or more. And so, um, but I, I'll open it up because it actually is faster uh, to do a lot of things and it looks nicer and it re- more responsive. And so I think that they've come a long way. It was good. I'm glad that they got the props here. I was glad to see that the app trend of the year is self care because I'm yeah. always pushing the self care apps on iOS today and Leo always makes fun of me. But um, <laughs> that's how you live your best life with self care apps. You put you put the oxygen mask on you first, Megan, and then exactly. you help the children. You put it on you first. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nope, um, that's absolutely true. Mm-hmm. Best self care yeah, apps, I, anyone? <laughs> I love that that uh, Procreate Pocket uh, because the Procreate for iPad has gotten so much attention, especially with Apple Pencil and new iPad Pros. But Procreate on the iPhone is just such a nifty implementation, especially considering the constraints of size and the limits of digital. Like you literally have to use your fingers to use it. And they still, James uh, Kuda and his team just did such a fantastic job with it. I also found it interesting that the best podcasts of the year are so different than the most downloaded podcasts of the year. And like, I get, I get it that with apps, it's often, you know, you look at the most downloaded apps and they're kind, they can, they can tend towards garbagey, more garbagey apps. But I always think of podcasts as being, um, you know, more of a, the, the, the best is going to rise to the top, but I guess maybe that's not true anymore. Like they're, they're just very different. I don't think anything on the best podcast, nothing on the best podcast of the year was also on the most downloaded podcast of the year. It's, it's a hard, it's a hard one to call because uh, when you, when they're endorsing a podcast, they are implicitly, or at least I'm sure Apple feels are implicitly endorsing all the content of that podcast. So maybe they can't, maybe they, they are focusing on, this is a, when I'm, when I'm looking at the list, there's not a whole lot of, uh, uh, there, there's a lot. A lot of these are very, very specific, like uh, a fatal, very fatal murder. Uh, uh, the, the, this American Life is is a constant, but again, it's a very, very highly produced podcast. Serial is by its name pretty much one story going on. Nine Nine Percent Invisible is another one where you know exactly what this person. It's a high level of content year after year after year. I think it would be a little. It seems like it would be a little bit difficult on Apple's part to to pick a. a, a to, to pick a podcast that might have a wider variety of content, people who might be sometimes able to be very, very angry with things mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and flag it as something that is that w- wants to be one of these, uh, what, 10 uh, podcasts that they can uh, put in, put onto this list. I mean, it's the, it's the kind of this, yeah, it's it's uh, going, going on and on and on about this, uh, about these uh, these selections. Like I said, I mean, they're they're nice. They're they're good kind of sales guides. I don't know if they're the best at helping people find stuff that they wouldn't ordinarily find like Drake as artist of the year. I'm really, really glad that Drake and Cardi B are finally getting some attention. Maybe uh, at on Christmas, uh, Christmas, the, when their, their parents have the usual, when are you going to Cardi B going to give up this 
failed music career and finally get a job at your uncle's lumberyard. He's offered you that that office manager job and kept it open mm -hmm. for you. It's like, but there are other performers who really, really need that shot in the arm, both economically and also just spiritual. Uh, spiritual is the wrong word, but I, I, I don't know what word I actually mean here. The but the the idea that sometimes it's nice to have some sort of external sign that hey, people are noticing and people who are not me or related to me. Uh, or who owe me money are telling me that this is good and worthy of other people's attention. It's interesting so. because I, I don't know if I'm stealing all of this from Alex from a previous show, but there's been this sort of tension in the Academy Awards as well, where it feels like they deliberately ignore the big successful movies for the smaller, more art house movies, which are sometimes better, but aren't always better. And some people would want them to go all in. Like, why can't Black Panther or Infinity Wars be movie of the year? But instead, they're going to pick I, something you know obscure I, I from have, I have, I have from a list England. of why Infinity Wars can't be movie of the year, but that's not this book. Well, no, but if you don't, but the, the, well, I would argue that list, sir, but uh, Thanos' actor of the year is high up there for me as well. But, um, but I, I think it's hard to sort of mash those, like to, to make sure that you are honoring everybody while giving attention. I don't know if that needs extra categories or not. And I really don't know if I just stole all this from Alex on a previous show. Well, the, but the, but the I, difference here is that with, uh, with the Academy, one of the reasons why it has a certain amount of integrity is that you've got 3000 people that tends, yes, mostly towards older white men. But but all you can say is that these 3,000 people voted this way, and it doesn't really point to a trend or anything, but this is how they voted. When you have something like the Golden Globes or Apple's Best of 2018, how is uh, – does uh, – where uh, the Academy doesn't control how – who wins best picture? It's always about how those 3,000 people choose to vote in that year with uh, in reaction to that lineup of that year's releases. How does, whereas the Apple's best of 2018 can really be, we have chosen that we want to spotlight these 10 movies, these 10 CDs, uh, albums, these 10 podcasts. And so you don't know what the reasoning is. So that's why, again, it's nice, but it's promotional rather than uh, celebrational, let's say. So we don't know who picks these. Is it the is it the the app store? The editorial teams oh, okay. uh, for the different for the app store for the movie store. They have a group of editors for each of those divisions, and they get together and work on them. Got it. Well, it's interesting too because like the best iPad of the year is the Frogopedia, which is the one where you dissect a frog, and that one was like <laughs> highly featured with the latest iPad or maybe last year's iPad. I can't. It remember. was in the keynotes. Yeah, it made me right. kind of squirm. It made me virtually squirm. Yeah. So it's sort of like, well, that's surprising that you know, I, I like you know, like Andy said, I want to hear about something I haven't heard about already. Well, and I think that I think that exactly. Apple, um, whether with the Frogopedia or, or, or the. <laughs> uh, one of the things, if you're an app developer, I think it does help you if you look at where Apple's trying to take the platform and you build something that really takes advantage of the new technologies and takes advantage of that. It, there's definitely something Apple's looking for. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to get something, but if you, you know, expend the energy and do something that's really uh, uh, groundbreaking in in that direction, of course, they're going to pay more attention to it. And so I think that was a good example of really showing AR in education, um, which is definitely something that, that Apple is interested in. And so and it was well executed. I mean, it doesn't help you if you do it and it's not well executed, but it, it, it was well executed. And I think that I think it is good that beyond just the what's most popular that that Apple is doing some work to help take stuff that may, may be more creative and giving it a, a shot in the arm. Uh, I, I know some developers who have said getting these kinds of recommendations from Apple or showing up uh, in an Apple ad or showing up even on that front page when you show up is worth and just an incredible amount of revenue. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it just it really makes a huge difference uh, when Apple kind when that kind of uh, that that appears. Um, and so, uh, I do think that you know it's it's a little opaque. You don't really understand exactly what's going on there to make that work. But a lot of things like that are opaque. <laughs> so yeah. the the raw charts, though, I think the pure democracy of the raw charts is not necessarily uh, the the way we want to make all of our choices. Okay, let's move on to the 10R. Uh, I want to know, is it is it selling or not? I feel like I cannot tell by reading the the headlines. Uh, Apple VP says it's the most best-selling uh, iPhone ever. But then, of course, uh, Mark Bloomberg, uh, Mark Gurman says... Uh, you can call that, him Mark Bloomberg now. It's yeah, fine. Mark Bloomberg. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, Mark. And, and 
<laughs> Mark and, and the worst is this is we're never going to know. We're never going to know yeah. whether it was the best selling yeah. or not yeah, we won't because know. they're so, not going to tell us. They're not, you know, they've they've decided we're we're we've separated all of these out and we're not I mean we're not well, going to separate No, but they these never they never the told you one. which device. They never broke down numbers by specific sub they, right. they said iPhone, they never said which model, but they will often Tim Cook will often say during the conference call, like I think he said the 7 Plus for the first time outsold the 7. And then he with the 10, he said the 10 was the most popular phone week in, work out. And it's the first time since they split the line that the most expensive one had been the bestseller. And Joswiak, Greg Joswiak, who runs product marketing for Apple, said the iPhone 10 XR uh, has been their best, their bestseller since launch. So they won't give you the numbers or the percentages. And it might be like I think Andy said on Twitter, might be they sold two instead of one <laughs> and put them over the top. But, you know, they – when an officer of the company does say, or a, you know, an executive of the company does say those things, I think they're pretty safe to to bet on. Yeah. Well, why? I mean, and, it feels like an important question to answer. Like, are people buying the cheaper phone that is very similar to the more expensive phone? Looks like. I, well, I I don't know. If, if I were an analyst, I might have a different answer. But this is not something that affects consumers. Uh, it's uh, it's. Uh, interesting. The, the the only way we know how well something sold is: are they going to continue to make it next year? Do is there a brand new version of this wonderful peach colored plastic phone? Uh, the the exuberantly plastic phone they introduced what three or four years ago? No, there is not. Which meant that the market just didn't. Uh, Apple didn't see a reason to continue it because people weren't weren't voting with their wallets for it. But otherwise, there's so many reasons why so many people could want. People to think that it's selling incredibly well and other people who really wanted people to think that it's not selling so incredibly well. Uh, and that goes uh, all the way down to part suppliers and so much business politics that I am glad I'm not a business analyst. This is why I'm someone who <laughs> goes out with cameras and, and six phones. And that's why instead of like looking at spreadsheets and looking at projections of, of cost of parts and stuff like that. Mm. Well, and yeah, I think that I think that the, is hard. The the X and the X and then now the XS, uh, you know, have or the 10s have, they they've taken some of the handcuffs off. Anytime you build a product, you you have to decide. Okay, I'm gonna I want all these I want this long list of features and all these cool things that we could add to it. And then this is how much it's going to cost to make it, and 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 you have to decide what that price point that target price point is, what your target margin is, what your all those things have to be calculated, and that limits what the designers can do. And I think that one of the things that having a less expensive phone has allowed Apple to do is take some of those limits off. I mean, they haven't taken all the limits off, but but they have definitely taken um, a fair number of handcuffs off. <laughs> a number of shackles off of the uh, iPhone development to allow them to kind of push the outer envelope of what they can do with the phone. Uh, the R uh, gives them that option of giving, letting people still have a lower cost one and the older, uh, the older phones uh, allow, you know, folks to have, you know, have something that is still very, very good. Um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, it allows them to keep on stretching forward, uh, with something that might be on, only what a handful of people, and, you know, and I would expect they are to be what would sell the most as far as pure numbers go. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be the, the highest revenue generator, but it, it definitely, um, you would expect it to be the, in the meat of the, of the, of the development, but it's hard to tell. I mean, I think that a lot of Apple users are the ones that want the two lenses and want those other bits and pieces, mm -hmm. but I think that there's a pretty strong market for the folks that, don't want to there's, spend quite that much money on a phone. There's something else too, which is interesting. And you know, Apple doesn't always get demand forecasting right. And it's a very tricky thing. Like with the iPhone SE, they didn't make enough because they thought it would appeal to people who wanted less expensive phones. They didn't realize how much it would, exp it would appeal to people who wanted smaller phones. So the market was roughly double what they thought it would be. And now with the iPhone XR, last year they were very careful to make an iPhone 8 and an iPhone 10 because they knew for some people, it, like despite how much the internet always says, mm, boring, uh, you know, if, if the same thing looks the same way two years in a Row. A lot of people find comfort in familiarity and they wanted people to be able to get a new iPhone with a new camera and a new processor that looked and worked the way their old one did. And this year they didn't do that. The new iPhones are only on the 10 stream, which means like no, no home button. And there are some people who believe that the iPhone 8 is selling incredibly well now because there are people who are ready to upgrade, but they're still, the iPhone 10 is still, or the 10s and the 10R are still too alien to them and they find comfort in the home button and they can save even more money by going to an iPhone 8 from an iPhone success or because most people don't change most people aren't like us nerds they don't change their phones every year <laughs> so they're looking at it two years out and they're thinking you know I understand this this is familiar to me I'm going to get this and that might not be something that Apple had in their demand forecasting they would have thought that people would choose between the 10s and the 10r and now a lot of people are, are also choosing 
there's a third candidate in this race, and a lot of people are also choosing the eight. But this stuff, it just it happens every time and almost every time. So far, every single time it has been wrong. It has been a blatant attempt between media and market manipulators to short the stock, drive it down, and just and literally cheat normal people out of their their money, out of their Apple stock. And it's worked quarter after quarter, but there's been a lot more attention on it. So I don't know if they've ramped up They've ramped up the rhetoric in order to keep doing it because it makes so much money for them. And we've shown Jim Cramer before literally admitting to this on tape, saying how he spreads a rumor and the Apple publications are more than happy to run it. And it it, bring, it drives the stock down and it makes his quarter for him. And we've seen it happen over and over again. Last time it was the iPhone 10 wasn't selling. Turns out it was the best seller. All the reports were wrong. And this quarter, they might be right. Absolutely possible they might be right. But I think given the history, you have to look at those with incredible skepticism every year. And I don't think the reporting on it always reflects that. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of uh, upgrading every year or not upgrading every year, uh, I, I believe none of us need to upgrade <laughs> every year. Uh, and if you have a battery that gets a, a cheaper upgrade, the $29 phone battery replacement, that'll end at the end of December. So get it while you still can, uh, December 31st. After that, Apple's going to charge $79. Have any of you taken advantage of this for any of your... Yes. <laughs> that was you, yep. Renee? I Yep. Yeah, I took I took my success in, took my God kids two successes in. I took everything <laughs> in that I could take in. And so you actually took them to an Apple store. You didn't ship yeah, them away. Yeah, I signed up and I got yelled at for making one appointment for three phones that are mm -hmm. three appointments for three phones. And I said I was terribly sorry and they helped me fix it up. And they gave me three separate appointments and took in all the phones. <laughs> <laughs> went back and very, very contritely, I went back and, and they fixed them up and they're all 100% battery health now. They are These are great. like three years old phones. Yeah, they're great for people like you and I who hand your phones down to people, you know, who don't, to younger people who can get a perfectly, you know, they, they will complain about the battery, but it's pretty easy to upgrade that. Yeah. Yeah, and they do it at cost and now it's at lower than cost. So take advantage of it while you can. And they, I think the program goes up, it doesn't go up to eight yet. I think it goes up to success or seven already, but just take it in and, and have it checked. Mm -hmm. I thought it was the SE to the, to the 10. I don't people. think the 10 qualifies for the cheaper replacements, though. Oh. I think the 10 has been, 10 and 8 have been moved to, and people got upset about this. They, they've been moved to part of the battery management, but they need so much less battery management than previous generations that I don't think anybody will notice, even if they're on full on uh, performance <laughs> control mode. Uh, but uh, I believe up to the 7, and maybe the 7 is only halfway, but. Uh, iPhone SE, iPhone 6, iPhone 6S, all of those you can get. And especially those, they've gone through, what, 200 charging cycles by now? Maybe more, depending on how you use them. It's well worth getting the cheap battery replacement. Yeah, and that's just a good opportunity to remind people that Apple has so many different, like, <laughs> exchange and repair extension programs you may not know about. Uh, and I'll paste into the show notes, but uh, go to apple.com slash support slash exchange underscore repair uh, or just Google for exchange and repair extension programs. Uh, and like right here, it says a 13-inch MacBook Pro non-touch bar solid state drive service program, iPhone 10 display module replacement program for touch issues, uh, and even just stuff that's really, really old and out of warranty. Uh, it does, that doesn't necessarily mean your phone is working fine, take it in and we'll give you a new parts for whatever. Uh, but sometimes it means that uh, something that you thought was not worth bringing in for because, oh, I can't afford to have the whole screen replaced. Well, maybe there's, there's a warranty extension program. Or like Renee, uh, like what we're talking about right now, maybe there's a program in place where they will do a free swap up because they've noticed they've got enough numbers back to know that this is a device wide issue as opposed to just a quirk of people. Someone must have dropped it and they forgot about it because it kept working, but they unintentionally caused some damage. Uh, so it's always it, it, any time that you've got uh, any kind of an issue with an Apple device, it's almost always worth making an appointment at a Genius Bar because they have the master list of everything uh, and you will often shocked by how much they might wind up doing for you. Plus, you know, there's 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 frozen yogurt stands at the mall. There are things you can do outside of as, as, as an excuse. Uh, on Twitter, some pe people who have been talking about the $29 uh, exchange program were telling me about how their, their iPhone 7 was kind of like old and decrepit and they broke like the glass or whatever. And so they just gave them a brand new iPhone seven because of course they didn't, that's not their problem. It's, it's the genius's problem and all kinds of things where they got much more than just a, a $29 battery out of it. So the worst that can happen is that they will, if you, if you've got a problem with the device, like let's say a MacBook Pro that has a huge kernel panic because it has a bad SSD, even though you've been taking really, really super great care of it since you bought it three years ago. And now you don't know what you're going to do if it can't get fixed. 
it's worth taking it in just in case there is like a logic board program or something that you didn't know about and say, oh, actually, I know it's three years old, but we can swap out the board for a nominal fee. Great. Do that then. So I think I got the numbers slightly wrong. Uh, Scooter X is saying the 10S, the 10S Max and the 10R are replaced that's $69 and all other eligible models are $79. So it costs more if you have an older phone? That's, I don't know if that's... It, it varies depending on, it's only, only, a, only the phones that were initially subject to the performance throttling are getting the super, super cheap battery discounts. Previous phones and later phones, I, th I think Apple has adjusted their prices across the board, but they do vary based on the model outside of those, those brands, okay. those uh, versions. Um, and I meant to mention, okay, there there we go. Uh, after replacements, batteries will be will be priced at forty nine dollars with the exception of the iPhone ten. Apple will charge sixty nine dollars for an iPhone ten replacement. Got it. Um, that's not bad either. No, it's not. I mean, cheaper than a brand new phone, better for the environment. yeah, and 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 also, frankly, if I could replace it myself by buying a kit for like thirty or forty dollars, I would pr myself. I would probably say I, I'm not. I'm not giving advice to people. I'm saying that if it were if it were my phone, I were in that case, I would very likely just say, you know what? Why don't I just take it to it's 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 going to cost me if I were to pay myself labor for this fix, uh, for ordering the parts, getting them in correctly, doing a careful job, and being responsible for what happens. I'd much rather pay thirty bucks to another person who, uh, particularly if that apple if it's an Apple store that will say, oh. Uh, turned out that I should not have been eating those Hostess snowballs uh, just before using uh, creating your phone because now it's all filled with that uh, with that uh, filling uh, in your board. So we're giving you a brand new phone. We're sorry. Whereas if I did that, they would just have a good laugh and people would probably post the photos on Instagram about, hey, look at this customer. <laughs> There's like all kinds of like like pink. Uh, pink, uh, uh, pink coconut uh, shreds all under, under the glass, and he wanted us to fix it for free. <laughs> there are many ways to be an Instagram influencer, Andy. There you go. That could be as long as I get those numbers up. Yeah. So you know, if if, if that if that bah. if 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 if, if, Insta if uh, YouTube and Instagram has taught us anything, so, so long as you're you're uh, you're you're a, uh, an a hole who gets views and clicks. <laughs> that, that that fits into the business plan, doesn't it? Well, I mean, back to what you were saying, it does usually cost the same to like order a kit for my fix it and the battery than to take it to the Apple store. Not everybody has an Apple store nearby right. and sending away your right. phone. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think 2019 is my year of fixing stuff on my own. Um, I had a set of Christmas lights that went out. I was so, they they went out and I didn't know why. And I asked Burke to help me. And there was a fuse inside and he showed me how to replace the fuse. <laughs> and again, this is something that I was like, ah, this is, it's it's empowerment. So when I was faced with, my kids uh, has an old iPhone 6. He was complaining about the battery. Is It's going to cost the same to get a kit for my fix it or to take it to the local place. Like to me, it's worth more to get the kit and make him do it himself because, you know, it's a teachable moment and ownership. Then teach, teach, teach him about ownership, that this is your phone, which means that you know how to fix it and you're responsible for fixing it. Right. And then you or, can. Or it'll teach you that, or it'll teach you that you probably should have done that because now you have to get him a new phone because <laughs> you broke it on the way through. That didn't happen. I'm so impressed though, Megan, okay, because my uh, 2019 is my year of breaking things myself. I haven't gotten to the point okay. of fixing. Well, send them to me and I'll fix them. I, I will. <laughs> uh, okay. We all have to have resolutions. So that that's mine. Because um, I just, <laughs> you know, the, there's too many phones in my drawer that could be used by someone else. I want, I mentioned HTC Cha-Cha. <laughs> exactly. I did have that. Uh, I um, meant to talk about this when we were talking about the 10R, but is there no Apple case for the 10R? Is no, it it's like the Twilight Zone. It's like the, the the Bermuda Triangle. They were Apple briefly mentioned on international versions of the press release that they would have a clear case available for the iPhone 10R. But people just expected them to have all the silicon and leather cases like they do for every iPhone. But nothing was available at launch. Still not available. There's been a dearth of um, dearth of third party stuff as well, which is bizarre too because typically they. They're way, they're way ahead. I mean, they were the same sort of uh, dummies available uh, pre-launch for the iPhone XR that there were for the XS that are smuggled out of the plants and used to make early manufacturing prototypes for cases. And we still don't see them. And it's it's perplexing. That really is. I don't understand. I feel like, um, I thought I saw it. Well, like Pat and Quill is one of my favorites. And they um, I thought they had a good XR case, but they're pricey. Um, I, I just can't believe why they'd, 
not have them yet. Do you think it really is because they were hiding that not uh, hiding that phone style from people? No, yeah, it, it was leaked. Like they, they, everyone on YouTube had like a 10s, a 10s yeah. Max, and the 10R model they were showing off months in advance. So mm. I don't, I don't get it. This is the greatest mystery of all time. It's, it's what it is, is they're behind the, they're behind air power in the manufacturing key and they're just sitting there tapping their foot. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you're in drive through <laughs> waiting for the person with a really large order. And just get angry, angry. There's one it's factory, the, the factory that's doing the air power and the factory that's doing the cases it turns out to be the same one. It doesn't seem like that would fit together, <laughs> but maybe that's the case. And the robots <laughs> don't know how to move one ahead of the other on the treadmill. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, all right. So, uh, Let's, uh, did you know that you can add uh, a Santa hat to your Memoji? Has everyone done that already? <laughs> I, I, I might've Instagrammed it. Oh, you did? <laughs> yes. uh, can we pull that up? How Was that today? Uh, yesterday. Oh, oh. Um, how, how did I not see that on Instagram? Um, so pretty, <laughs> pretty easy to do. It's just in the hat section. Yeah, it was, the hat was white, which I think nobody noticed because it's been there since launch. You've been able to do this literally since WWDC in June. But because the hat was white, nobody really paid attention to it. And off season, it was the wrong brand. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a couple of people on Twitter noticed that you can make it green for Elf or you can make it red for Santa. And then immediately all the Will Ferrell and, uh, and you know, like, like the, the, the Santa Claus things had it happening. And it was, it's just great. It's just like one of those little Easter eggs that you stumble upon. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. The weather outside was frightful, but my emoji was mm -hmm. delightful. Mm -hmm. uh, important additions to your emoji. Okay, is there any Apple news I missed before we get to our picks? Anything important that we need to talk about that I missed? Mm -hmm. No? Nothing that I remember. For, okay. Tim right. Cook is, uh, is, is, is laying down the moral smackdown on everybody, though, Megan. I mean, that, that's continuing. He just got an honor, an award, and he's, he's talking about the values of privacy and dignity and civil rights. And uh, that, That's important. Um, I am a huge Tim Cook fan. Um, and, yeah, also uh, they're the other big uh, uh, humanitarian news this week from Apple is that uh, to celebrate World AIDS Day. They announced how much money they were giving, the, how much money they donated to Product yeah. Red and a really interesting article on the Apple News Store about where that money is going to. Um, it tells the story of some uh, some women in, a, in an AIDS clinic and um, it's pretty amazing. And also this week only, I think, if um, if you buy anything from the Apple Store, a dollar of that goes to Pro mm -hmm. Product Red. Project. And all the Apple stores have the red logos up again, which is nice to see this time of year. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think we covered all all of the news. Um, oh, ScooterX says that their Apple is on uh, launching a online store with ten percent discount for active military yeah. veterans. So yeah. that's uh, important too. Um, and whenever we really talk about this stuff, every you know, everyone's like, "Well, it's you know, they could do more." But of course, but my big thing is just because everybody could do more all every, the time. You could do more. Yeah. I could do more. Yeah. Everybody could do more. Let's start with doing something, right. be inspired, and then do more. Exactly. Yeah. Just Agreed. because you can't do everything doesn't mean you should do nothing. And yes. uh, if every dollar from an Apple Store uh, purchase goes, that, that's a lot of dollars. Yes. So. Yeah. All right. And well, encourage other companies to do the same thing. And if they are, encourage them to talk about it because it really does inspire people to do more. Make it competitive. Let's see which company can do the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's been working with uh, taking uh, content off of their platforms. Yeah. <laughs> pretty competitive well, also, about that. Also, we, we, we can cite the, the legal precedent of Miracle on 34th Street when, when the, so the Macy's Santa uh, decided to create this program for uh, making sure that people get the best deals everywhere. Gimbals couldn't couldn't put up with that. So, so even Gimbals <laughs> decided. And then, and then they're both challenging each other to donate more to, for, for the old age home. So there's there's ample there's ample precedent for this mm -hmm. sort of thing. So well, bravo. And, and I think that we're going to I think we're going to see as, as social media becomes more important, as it's harder to get advertising. I think these kinds of initiatives are going to be more and more important for corporations. Uh, they have to, and it's not something they can do just around Christmas. It's something that I think Apple's doing more of since um, Tim Cook took over. I think that we're going to see that happening a lot more. It's it's creating kind of a a, a reservoir of goodwill, <laughs> as my 
as my father would say, uh, <laughs> is that you, you know, being out there and making a difference in the community is going to let you get over other bumps. And I think that some corporations that have, are having a lot of trouble haven't done a lot of that. Um, and so when they have bad press, it's hard to, you know, get that over because there's nothing there. They're just seen as big corporations. And when they, when things go wrong, they do not get the benefit of the doubt. If you spend a lot of time uh, doing a lot of that outreach and making a big difference uh, or making any difference uh, on an ongoing basis, I think you, you start developing a relationship with the public um, that gives you a little room to, to work if uh, things aren't working out. Exactly. And a, a corporate responsibility in terms of environmentalism is also really important. The big environmental report that sort of got lost on that Friday uh, after Thanksgiving, one of the things it said was that uh, whereas like maybe some of our government programs are hurting some of the advances, uh, environmental advances that we've had, corporations are picking up the slack a little bit um, in there and they could do more, but they're doing a lot um, to... Yep. Okay, uh, we've got your picks. Get your picks ready. Um, get them ready right now, though. I want to thank the sponsor of this show, Rocket Mortgage. If you are in the market for a house, whether it be your first house or your 25th house, Rocket Mortgage will be there for you to take some of the anxiety out of it. I know uh, you don't have to feel anxious about buying a house it is I mean we'll just say it might be the most expensive thing you'll ever buy in your entire life but you don't have to feel anxious about it there might be rising interest rates uh, there might be unpredictability but rocket mortgage from Quicken Loans uh, will help they'll help ease that anxiety but they're they're calling it the power buying process so the power goes back to you and here's how it works First, you just answer a few questions. They'll check your credit for a pre-qualified approval, and then they will verify your income, your assets, and your credit, and it only takes less than 24 hours, sometimes even faster than 24 hours, and they will give you verified approval, which gives you the strength of a cash buyer. If you've ever been, if you've ever lost out on a house and, and someone said, well, they offered cash. I always wonder like, who are those people that can offer cash for a house in Northern California? But now you can have the strength of a cash buyer. You can look just like the cash buyer. Once you're verified, you qualify for their all new exclusive rate shield approval. First, what they do is they lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. That's three months. You can have three months to shop around and find your perfect home. And now here is the best part. If rates go up, your rate will stay the same while you're shopping around. Your rate stays the same. You don't have to feel rushed. Like, oh, I have to buy this house before my rates go up. But if rates go down, then your rate also drops. Either way, you win. You win this uh, anxiety trap of buying a house. It's the kind of thinking you'd expect from America's largest mortgage lender. If you want to get started, if you're even if you even have an inkling of buying a home, even in the next year, go to rocketmortgage.com slash MacBreak. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS consumer access .org, number 3030. That's rocketmortgage.com slash MacBreak. And we thank Rocket Mortgage from Quicken Loans for their support of Mac Break Weekly. All righty. I am going to say Alex goes first because his name comes first in the alphabet. No, no. <laughs> So my my pick is actually something you can watch on your Apple TV if you have Netflix. Uh, it's called Brainchild. And uh, Brainchild is a – I think it came out about a month ago. And it is just a great example of, I don't know, where I think education should go. So it is uh, – it's really designed for kids and science. Um, they've got a great host. Uh, hosts are important. And they've added a lot of production value uh, to it. And so it's cut well. It's fast moving. Uh, you know, I think that when we start talking, when I talk about e-learning uh, and when I talk about those those things, I think that this is what I'm talking about is trying to make it fun, but dealing with a lot of the technical pieces of it, getting, you know, kids excited about learning those things. Uh, and it's, um, you know, I don't know how many episodes, I think they have seven or eight episodes that are that are out in this season. And and I encourage people to go watch it, even if you, here's the thing, is that this is the, this could be something that uh, really, if, if, if this is one little step towards this, this being successful on Netflix, me, you know, and more seasons being created and, and them seeing this as a model is important. So I want to make sure that people get out there and even if you just hit play and then go mow the lawn, you know, get some hours in there of it, um, but definitely show it to your kids. Um, everybody that I've, 
talk to. I've, I've been out of the house, so my kids haven't since I since I discovered that it was there. So I'm going to be testing it on my kids here soon. But um, they saw that they saw the trailer and they're they're pretty excited about it. So I think they're probably going to be done with the season by the time I get home. Um, but it's uh, it's it's got some great graphics in it. Um, it's a lot of fun. And it's really what I think that you know, this is what I think lectures should be in, in school. And then we can have discussions, which is the classroom time with the teacher. But I think that, um, it'd be a lot better if we went through the subject a little bit faster with a lot more graphics and have it be a lot more fun. So, um, definitely check it out. It's called brainchild and it's on Netflix and it's, um, free if you've got a subscription. Uh, what age kids would you say? Like your, your age kids around? I think that you could watch it, you know, into the early teens. Uh, you know, I, I'll watch it either way because it's fun to watch. But I think that, yeah, I think that it, it's probably aimed at eight to twelve. Is is my guess? You know, watching it um, is uh, it's that's probably the target audience. Uh, but I think it's a lot of fun to watch either way. I think there's a lot of good science in there that that's fun to watch no matter what age you are, you're at. Uh, if you're an educator, I would definitely uh, or someone who's building e-learning products, I would definitely take note um, that it's kind of amazing when Amazon applies that amazing amount of uh, uh, of funds that they have towards creating high production quality education materials. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a good model. Uh, I don't know if everyone can afford to do it that way, but it's, it actually, to me, is a step up from even some of the stuff that we used to see, you know, in Nova. Mm -hmm. which I thought was Nova was like something I was, I was always like, I just wanted to be just like Nova. And then I went back and looked at Nova and I was like, my expectations are very low. <laughs> I can't, it's gotten better. But I, I, uh, I looked at the older Novas that I used to use as reference and I was like, Oh, that wasn't, that wasn't, that was good for the time. Uh, so this is a, a really, um, some really high quality, uh, you know, content. So I, I would definitely check it out. Yeah, my kids, uh, they, whenever they come up with some scientific fact uh, that I check and it turns out to be true, I, you know, I always ask them, where did you learn that? And it's almost always YouTube. It's very rarely school. Um, and <laughs> that yeah. is, but they do share that stuff and they're, uh, I'm friendly with their teacher who's just like, oh God, your boys gave me 10 YouTube videos I had to watch this weekend to <laughs> make sure they're appropriate <laughs> for class. And, you know, it's, it's great. But I, I wonder the, um, the high production value, I think part of, what my kids like about the stuff that they see on YouTube is the kind of, you know, it's just some dude in his garage um, who likes science as much as they do, you know? It, it, I think it can be. I think that when we, when we talk about covering those subjects, though, I mean, there is a little love. If you start designing it and really working through uh, well-designed, well-thought-out, high-quality high graphics, you can make it easier to understand what you're talking about. And I think that the, they can support that, that process effectively. I think that they – I'm sure that they like the other bits and pieces, but I think that they also don't have a lot to, to compare it to. Most, of educational, most educational videos uh, and materials are pretty low, uh, low production value. So I think that it is – a, you know, be able to start seeing what good production value could look like. It, it'd be interesting to have your kids look at it and 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 uh, and and let you know whether they they think it's too shiny or, or something. I think that there's room for both of those. Of we're gonna just get in there and hack away, and you get to be part of it. But I think that there's also understanding complex. Uh, microscopic or electricity or physics, I think that there's ways to understand these kind of complex um, uh, interrelationships that are hard if you don't use some graphics to draw it out and and to play it out and so that you can really understand what you're looking at and create context. Um, I, but I think that then also those videos that are much more uh, rough around the edges or, or um, are, are useful as well. So I, I don't think that there, I think there's room for both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, they like mostly stuff that uh, that gets set on fire, like that. If science involves <laughs> things that are about to explode, but unfortunately, that you can't you can't do everything. You can't set everything on fire. You know that's yeah. the hard oh, part. Oh yes, it's you hard can, to learn. Alex. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, you I've haven't tried. seen you I've haven't tried. seen science videos on YouTube. It's all it's it's they I, call them a science video, but it's always about what happens if you pour this thing on this other thing. Woo! Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm learning. Really yeah, I, a level I'm, up I'm really glad that. there's. I'm really glad YouTube wasn't around when I was a kid. Yeah. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, they, yes. they just spent their allowance on like a, a Tesla coil thing. Um, yep. And I don't think it's going to set on fire, but it might. Like, but they're really excited because you know they'll put the <laughs> light bulb next to it and the light bulb lights up. It's kind of like what they're they're creating their own wireless charging system in their bedroom. Mm -hmm. So. Um, when they, they start talking about two million volts or one million, you know, the difference between half a million and two million volts and the in the length of the arc, then uh, then you know you're in trouble. Okay. They've they've realized that they need a lot of a lot of voltage. <laughs> okay, good to know. Um, all right, Andy, you come next in the alphabet. What's your pick? Today's lesson is the natural resistance of air as a medium for transmitting <laughs> electricity. 
Exactly. <laughs> it's not a question of you can't transmit electricity through the air. You just have to put a lot of it because it's a very, very big resistor. <laughs> uh, two, uh, two picks that I'm really, really happy about. Uh, one is not necessarily tech related. I'll, I will take Alex's uh, lead and say that because you can watch Netflix on a Mac or an iPad, uh, the Christmas Chronicles uh, with uh, Kurt Russell as Santa on Netflix. Oh my God, this is like instantly one of my favorite Christmas movies of all time, and I'm going to be watching it every single year. Uh, this, uh, every, it's, uh, uh, it avoid, you could tell the people who are writing this really, really love this gig. And they really decided to do a great job on it. It has none of the. It, it's great because it doesn't have the usual cliches of a holiday movie, particularly a holiday Santa movie. Uh, it, it's actually a really good story. It's modern without saying, "Oh, Santa, you you have an Apple Watch? Ho ho ho! Of course, and I have everything now. My list is now in the cloud." Which is like, okay, fine, that's easy. Also, there aren't like farting elves, and nobody get hit, gets hit in the nuts. That's like those are the usual <laughs> things you expect when they do. Let's do a modern, uh, a modern Christmas uh, Santa Claus story that will appeal to like everybody. Uh, but this is, and also Kurt Russell is an amazing Santa. Uh, he's he's modern while still clearly being hundreds of years old, if not centuries old. The beard works, the the the, the costume works, the hair works. If you don't get the Santa right, you don't got no movie. Now. Uh, I'm highest recommendation, but one of the real reasons why I'm glad I get an opportunity to recommend it specifically is that I have to tell you, the first 20 minutes suck with a capital su. It's terrible. If not for the fact that a friend of mine recommended it highly to me, I would have absolutely bailed because the first 20 minutes are strictly like lifetime made for TV Christmas movie quality stuff. Not as bad as the Christmas shoes, but you are if you've seen if you if you have survived a viewing of the Christmas shoes, you are right to be cautious and dump out of it just in case you're about to be walking into another Christmas shoe situation. So stick with it. Kurt Russell shows up in about the first after about 20 minutes. After that, it's nothing but absolutely wonderful and uh, highest 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 recommendation um the other the other one is uh it's also christmas related but this one is mac related uh barebone software the maker of uh, bb edit uh, they're having their 25th anniversary year and they're closing out the year by opening the bb edit merchandise store so now you can get like B, the classic bb edit t-shirts with the bb edit logo and the classic slogan uh still doesn't suck uh you can get uh, like uh you can get uh, bags you can get uh, uh, sweatpants. They have a brand new T-shirt, which I got a pre-release copy of, uh, reinterpreting their uh, one of their famous slogans as a rebus. And I don't, I don't know if you can figure that. I'm going to give you the best, the best chance possible by getting it there. <laughs> That's great. I don't know what. What's the first thing? The first item is a oh, still. Still. Still saving. Why or, or still saving your. Oh yeah, got it. Saving your donkey. Yes, exactly. <laughs> saving your saving your pack animal. <laughs> because you know we have a great time at the Grand Canyon, but do we ever think about the welfare of those poor animals that do nothing but uh, shuttle American tourists up and down those paths? So, fortunately, the good people at Barebone Soft. You know, it's. I don't think any of this money is going towards any charity. I think it's going to, towards the charity of helping the people at Barebones continue to uh, make really, really great software. Uh, so it's it's cool stuff. I, I I predict that anybody at WWDC next year who is not have who does not have something from this fashion collection included as part of their clothing wardrobe for the week is definitely going to be not on trend. Uh, so I've, I've, I've already they 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 sent they sent me the T-shirt, but I'm buying like another T-shirt and a pin because I think I need a BB edit pin for bags and hats and stuff. Love it, Renee. What's your pick? So I decided to go for it anyway, even though Leo's not here and we cannot spend 10 minutes putting Andy and Alex to sleep talking about it. <laughs> uh, Pokemon announced their player versus player, long awaited player versus player trainer battles uh, today. I did a whole long video on it for people who are really in-depth interested in it. But the gist is you'll be able to challenge anybody in person or your ultra or best friends over the internet. You'll be able to battle up to three times a day for rewards. Uh, you'll be able to battle the gym leader, the team leader, sorry, for rewards. You can keep battling beyond that. You just won't get rewards anymore. But it's just another thing they've added to the 
they've added to the game from weather to raids to the new gym system uh, to a lot of other things that even though I've been playing now for over two and a half years and I've done almost everything that you can do, they just keep adding more and more stuff to it. And they do it in a way that is that is like a fitness focus. Like you get, you get reward. Now one of the latest additions is the more you walk every week, the more, the more bonus stuff you get. So if you pass, uh, I think it's five kilometers, 20 kilometers, 50 kilometers. I was at 49.8 last week. So I was really bummed. I got to get to it. You get more stuff. And also now they're trying to promote a lot more social interaction. So it's not just learn about your neighborhood, but actually, you know, talk to your neighbors. And I know it kind of sucks that we have to have a game and gamification to make us do that in our post-industrial now post maybe information age but if not that then what if not now then when so i'm taking i'm taking everything that they will give me it has it hasn't shipped yet it was just announced today could ship as early as next week i think they probably want to get all the bugs squashed before they roll it out uh but it should be a lot of fun and just in time for the holidays so, so I uh, check it out and i walk around a lot do i have to have the pokemon app out um because no I so a, they added this teddy, two teddy weeks ago. Rusa is right there but i have no balls <laughs> uh you can get yeah well i mean just spin some stops and they'll you'll you'll get some more balls okay. but they added something called health sync uh, two or three weeks ago where you can connect it to android health or health kit the, the health app on ios and then it'll just use the built-in um sensor fusion hub on your phone to sort of track how far you've gone how many steps you've taken and give you credit for them even though you're not in the game and it'll even let you hatch eggs and do other in-game stuff uh while and i've got the the pokemon ball that i suggested last week for uh for the nintendo switch and you can set that up and it'll it'll spin the stops for you while you're out too so instead of having your head down looking at a phone i'm just walking around enjoying nature and it's just giving me <laughs> treats along the way which is great um, I have two quick picks. One is, um, I didn't put this in the uh, doc. I guess you can't really see my screen, can you, um, uh, Karsten? Oh, there we go. Uh, it's the, this is the test, the Joytech Music Tesla Coil Arc Plasma Loudspeaker Wireless Transmission Experiment <laughs> Desktop Toy. And the reason why I show this is not necessarily that you should go out and buy this one, but I'm pretty sh I feel that my kids overpaid for this. It's $69.99, $70. But when the, your kids save their money and they want to buy what you think might, you know, have only three customer reviews. So really, if anyone has another Tesla coil that would work, that would be less than $70, <laughs> uh, that um, email me at Megan at twit.tv. Um, so just... Just, just make sure you have that conversation with your kids first that some toys are okay to lick, some other toys are only okay to lick <laughs> sometimes. So just, what, what would uh, happen if, I'm sure they've already licked it. Like what, <laughs> they're 13. Um, what they, happens they if you a little put your jumpy. tongue to it? it? Would it set your tongue on fire or just hurt a little? I've never tried. I did. Uh, I did stick a key into yeah. a power outlet when I was five years old. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't terribly unpleasant, although you, it, it didn't kill me, though it could have. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, I, I that that basically taught me to again some electricity is meant to be played with some electricity like a Tesla coil perhaps I'm not gonna I'm gonna let someone else tell me whether you can lick one or not okay <laughs> good that is the biggest question why uh, where the air power is why there's no uh, 10R <laughs> case and can you lick a Tesla coil and my uh, my final pick is the lyric section on Apple Music. Um, which I recently used because I don't know if you guys have read the lyrics recently to Baby It's Cold Outside, the song. Um, one of my children mm. pointed out that it's kind of, um, uh, you can't really see, unfortunately. But all the songs have lyrics, right? You know, if you open them up and they, uh, I don't mean to um, badmouth Ella Fitzgerald because she's one of my favorites. But um, yeah, it is a little bit... Um, shall we say, uh, as my son pointed out, it sounded a little rapey. So um, I tweeted this out, got a lot of responses. People like, oh, I never listened to that. And then a lot of people saying, well, at that time, it was just uh, a woman uh, that a woman was never allowed to stay out late. She was always seen uh, as, um, you know, she had to always go home and it was just her trying. She really wanted to stay. So I just want to, you know, it's up to you to decide. Um, none of you are commenting and that's okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying, okay, I'm, go uh, ahead. again, it's, uh, it was a friend of mine. Uh, <laughs> uh, a friend of mine posted on the blog uh, a the original version of this, which was written kind of like as a party piece for the composer and his wife, or maybe their co-composers. That uh, was so popular that like they would get invited to parties just to sing this duet together. Uh, and it's exactly as uh, as you were told that it was like. 
uh, I have to I have to be I have to have an excuse yeah. to say, oh, why? Why was when you when you when you go back to your apartment and the house mother is asking, why were you why did you come home? Oh, it was it was so cold and so snowy outside that I ju it was just unsafe. I felt unsafe. That's why I stayed until out until past 10 p.m. last night with that date that I was on. So, yeah, but it does. One of the things that's kind of interesting about new understanding is that intent is not as big of a factor as people crack it up to be. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that this was written at a time where it meant something totally different. The intent was certainly not, hey, I'm about to commit a crime here. Uh, but the fact that it's now 2018 and people are going to hear it much, much differently, it doesn't make it a bad song. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody should ban it, but it does mean that some people are going to think maybe it's a good idea for us to take this off the playlist because, again, the intentions of speech – uh, are not the entire story. It's how it's the effect that they have on the listener that has to be really, really thought of. It's not not the not the old not the only part of the discussion, but uh, the fact that oh well, this is this was not written that way. That doesn't end the discussion. It's how people are listening to it. If you're if you're having a bunch of people over for Christmas for a Christmas party and you don't want a discussion about it, then don't put it in the list. Yeah. If you I want a discussion about it, then throw it right in there and maybe have it come up every ten songs, you know. And and you'll eventually someone's going to realize between their eggnogs that you're playing the song, and then they'll then the uh, the, the, the family Christmas the everybody. Will <laughs> Yeah, I'll yeah, just exactly. I, I would not. I will just say this. it's not like it's it's not like uh, <laughs> it's not like the Pepe Le Pew cartoons and Warner Brothers where now. I've I did I, did, I didn't think twice about it when I was a little kid watching it on Saturday mornings. They're still really funny, but yeah, yeah. it really is about a guy trying to mash on a lady who is showing every sign whatsoever that she would rather be left alone and perhaps well, for I, that you know, there's reason so many things, <laughs> there's so many things that we watch that, that we watched that, that, that were just horrible they I mean, were like, all I, chain I, smokers I like, in the cartoons <laughs> Well, I was like, I was like, also like, why don't any, why doesn't anybody uh, play Johnny Quest on TV anymore? Because I love Johnny Quest. <laughs> I mean, that was like my, that was my show. You know, it was all, you know, it was, it was geeky and it was whatever. And I, uh, and I went ahead and got some of them on, on, uh, I think on iTunes or whatever. And and I watched it and I was like, oh, I can't, watch, I can't show this to my kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. You, gonna... you want to know something funny? They're they're reboot or they're they're launching. A, excuse me. On YouTube, there's a new series of like Popeye cartoons. Uh, and right. so you can't and so I can see the I, the fact that, OK, you can't have like, the original like 1920s, 30s version where he's always got a pipe in his mouth. But now they yeah. have a, just for no particular reason, always walking around with a whistle in his on the corner of his mouth. Oh, that's no. like kind of like the shape yeah. of a pipe. So you can still do the, yeah, do maybe it's like, a rape whistle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you brought that all the way back around. <laughs> I did. Yeah. I that's, know. A, that's, a, that's a professional keeping it on message. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you guys. It's lovely to have this discussion with you. And, um, you know, I go, I can go anywhere and you're game. And I love that. And I hope this means that Leo will let me come back to this show. Um, I'm so too. <laughs> Alex, Lindsay, uh, anything uh, in your world that, uh, that you need to, to uh, talk about that we don't you, anything you're doing right now. No, no, I'm on I'm I I'm on Twitter. I, I think I was, I've been spending more time on Twitter than I used to. I don't know why. Okay. I just enjoyed the conversation. So anyway, I'm there. Mm -hmm. Andy, how about you? Uh, the next big thing coming up is I'm uh, going to if anyone's going to going to be at uh, the second performance of La Traviata at the Metropolitan Opera Friday night. I'm going to be there, so say hi. Uh, I will be wearing a tie, so don't be and not wearing a hat, so don't be thrown. Uh, but I'm also uh, my next uh, radio uh, thing on WGBH Boston is going to be Thursday, and as usual, we'll see how much evil Facebook has done between now and then that we can talk about. But we'll, we'll probably have some more lighthearted stuff to talk about as well. And Renee, what what's up on your YouTube channel or on iMore these days? Uh, I just did the all the Pokemon stuff. I spent <laughs> I spent most of this week using an iPhone 6s and an iPhone 10R, sometimes side by side, sometimes one and the other, because I wanted a better sense of what the upgrade cycle looked for somebody who actually didn't work in tech and didn't have the, the massive problem of upgrading from a 10 to a 10R every year. Uh, so I have a video on that hopefully up uh, tomorrow. 
Well, thank you guys all so much. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Mac Break Weekly records every Tuesday. Uh, usually it's supposed to start at 11. Um, this week it actually did start at 11 because Leo's not here. So who knows when it's going to start next week. Uh, but you can, of course, download it. You can stream it. You can watch it whenever you want. Subscribe to the podcast. Go to twit.tv slash Mac Break. And uh, yeah, tell your friends about it and uh, screenshot your podcast app and tweet it out if you love this show. Um, other people might love it too and you can share that. So Leo will be back next week. I am Megan Maroney and I guess now I'm supposed to say that Mac break, Mac time, break time, Mac time break is over. <laughs> Get back to work. Break time, Mac over is <laughs> <laughs> Break no, time is over. It's, you, it's re repair time is starting. Yes, Break repair, time is over. Yes, repair exactly. Time is repair time is starting. <laughs>